Last week, we began a brand new series um, just that really, I think, talks about how we feel sometimes, no matter how long we've been serving the Lord, no matter where we are with God. Um, when we go through difficulties, we think that there should be an answer to our, our problems. And so we, uh, we, we naturally go to God and we start to pray. And isn't it true that uh, sometimes the circumstances and the problems in our life are so big and we pray so hard and we plead with God, we beg God, we even get emotional. Sometimes we shed tears with God and we pray some more and we pray even harder and then we get to the end of our prayer and it would be great if there would be some loud, thundering, booming voice saying, all right, here's the answer to your prayer. But we get to the end of our prayer, we might say amen or we just say the last word of our prayer nothing and our circumstances haven't changed and they don't change and it's not that we're praying for bad things we're not praying for selfish things we're not praying for wrong things we're praying for big things oh God please let my mom and dad get back together Oh God, please, I am so aching inside because of my singleness. Oh God, why did you have to take my spouse? Oh God, why do I have to have this cancer? Why does my family have to be going through this? We pray for big stuff. We pray for good stuff. We pray for the right stuff. And then sometimes when life gets challenging and difficult and we know we need to start praying more, we, we suddenly start to, start to live a little bit different. We're trying to leverage and bargain with God to try to hopefully get some sort of an answer from Him. And again, we get to the end of our prayer and there's nothing. Nothing. And when we live in that season long enough, any one of us in this room is a candidate to begin questioning the reality of God. Does God really exist? And I want you to understand something that we, we kind of camped out on for a little bit last week, that sometimes we interpret God's behavior or his approval of us based upon the circumstances of our life. That when things are great in our life and God just seems to answer every prayer and everything, I've got the right job, the right spouse, the right family, the right parents, the right everything, God is so good. But then we get into the lowest of lows. We are in the valley. We are in the pit. And we wonder, where are you, God? And why are you angry? What did I do wrong to deserve this? Understand, sometimes the problems that we have experienced in our life, let's just be honest, some of the greatest difficulties that we have in our life are because we have behaved our way into them. By one choice at a time, one choice led to another choice, to another choice, and we behave our way into circumstances we never wanted to get into. We never intended to be there. We never wanted to be there. And then we behaved our way in, and we try to pray our way out. It doesn't work that way. You behaved your way in, behave your way out. Then you need to also understand, sometimes the reasons we get into difficult circumstances in our life is because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is stained by sin. We live in a world where people get diagnoses and they die. We live in a world where little children who have never intentionally sinned get cancer and die. We live in a world where people tragically die in car accidents. We live in a world where people get killed, where people get a disease, where bad things happen to good people. That's the world that we live in because we live in a fallen world that's been stained by sin. It's the reality of where we live. And then, and then, isn't it true that sometimes when we are in the lowest of lows, when we're in the pit, oh, there's some well-meaning, well-intentioned Christian that tries to encourage us, well, you know, problem you have in your life, you just need more faith in your life. Just need more faith. What does that mean? Or they'll say something like, well, you just need to give it to God. What do you think I've been doing? I've been giving it to God. I've been praying, and I don't know what it means. What, what does it mean to give it to God? And you know what? If you would read your Bibles, you would find the Bible is filled with stories of men and women who had great faith, did everything right, but sometimes found themselves in the middle of circumstances that would make it seem, feel, look like God is so far away. 
Last week we talked about a guy named John the Baptist. John the Baptist did everything right. And he pleaded with God, I'm sure, to get out of prison. But he died in prison. Today we talk about a guy named Saul. Saul hated Christians. Persecuted the church. He was on his way to another town to do some more persecuting. And while this bad guy was on his way to do bad things, God steps into his life. Miraculously changes the content of Paul's heart, or Saul's heart. And when his character changed, the content of his heart changed, his name was changed from Saul to Paul. Paul uh, is responsible for writing more than two-thirds of what we call the New Testament part of our Bible. For 20 years, Paul preaches the gospel, preaches the word. He tells other people about Jesus Christ. He plants churches. Largely, he's responsible for our existence here today. And yet, in the midst of doing all the things right, he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was whipped, he was stoned, he was imprisoned, he was starved, he was beaten again for doing the right stuff. But Paul didn't complain about that stuff. Paul had another issue in his life that he reveals to us in one of the letters that he wrote to a church in the city of Corinth. He had this this impediment We don't know what the difficulty was. We don't know what the problem was. But he had this problem, and he asked God to remove it. And every time he asked God to remove this problem in his life, the answer was the same from God. You know what the answer was, if you know anything about this letter? The answer was no. No. No, I'm not going to do that. God would say to Paul, you know, I don't care how much you try to beg me, leverage, I don't care how much you, 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 you try to cajole, I don't care how much you do that, the answer is still the same, no. But in place of that, I'm going to give you something else. And that's what we're going to talk about for a little bit this morning. So if you want to follow along in your Bible, I'm going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse number 7. This is a letter that Paul writes to a church in Corinth. In this letter, he reveals a challenge that he dealt with, how God dealt with him, and how he resolved in uh, accepting the answer from God. He says in verse number 7 of 2 Corinthians 12, to keep me from becoming proud... His battle was the same as your battle, the same as my battle, to keep me from becoming proud. I was given a thorn in my flesh. We don't know what the thorn is. We'll talk about it more in a moment. A messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. There's a lot of thought on what this thorn is. We don't know if it was an eye problem. In one of his letters, he says, see with what large letters I'm writing this letter to you, indicating maybe he had a sight problem. We don't know if it was malaria. We we don't know what the problem was. But we know that he had this physical problem that he pleaded with God about over and over. He was essentially saying in his prayer, God, I'm asking you to do for me what I've seen you do for other people. I mean, this is, this is Paul. Wherever Paul went, there was miracles that followed, just like the miracles that Jesus did. In fact, one time, I I love this kind of a church, Paul was preaching a sermon. There was a kid sitting up on the second story window listening to the sermon. You know, the sermon got long. Not like mine. It got long. He fell asleep, falls out of the window to his death. He died. Paul, he just kind of stopped the sermon, goes down, lays hands on the boy. He comes back to life, finishes his sermon. How many want to go to that church? But that's the kind of stuff Paul experienced. And now he's saying, God, can you do that kind of stuff for me? Will you do that kind of stuff for me? In fact, in verse number 8, he says this, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Three times. I know, you're more spiritual than Paul. You're thinking, well, you should have prayed four times, you know? He probably, if you would have prayed one more time, he would have got it. I don't think Paul just kind of threw up this little prayer to God three different times. Oh, God, please take away this thorn. I think it was days, perhaps weeks, that he pleads with God to remove this. And every time he asked God, the answer was the same. Look at the answer in verse number 9. Here's what God said. My grace is all you need. (laughs) What? My grace is all you need. Like, 
I mean, we would read this and go, at least he got an answer. I never get an answer when I pray to God. What do you mean my grace is all you need? I don't want your grace. I want the thorn gone. I want the healing. I want the marriage restored. I want my family back. I want my mobility back. I want my life back. I want my health back. I don't want your grace. What in the world do you mean by grace? My grace is sufficient for you. That's such a Sunday school answer, isn't it? It's almost like saying you just need more faith. Just give it to God. What do you mean grace? But that's what God told Paul when he prayed. And you know what this grace is? I'll tell you what grace is. Grace is the ability to take one more step, one more day, one more event, one more circumstance, one more day, one more day at the job, one more day in the marriage, one more day with the pain, one more day with the impediment, one more day with the challenges, one more day with whatever it is that's in your life that does not seem to move. It's the strength and the ability to do it one more time. And sometimes it's not even the day, it's the moment. That God comes alongside of you and says, look, 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 look. I'm not going to answer your prayer the way you want me to pray, but I'm going to give you something in replace of that. It's called grace. I'll just I'll give you strength to deal with it. And here's the reason why. God always has a reason, and he gave a reason to Paul. He says in the other part of that verse, verse 9, he says, look, my power works best in weakness. My power works best in weakness. What does that mean? It means this. Um, let's just be honest. We're human beings. We love to celebrate our strengths in the end zone. I mean, as soon as something great happens in our life, you know, we're at the end zone, spike the ball, yeah, and the whole crowd cheers. We got the trophy, name is in the paper, we're on TV, and the cameras are, oh, how did you get through this? And you're saying, well, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know how I did it, you know, but, and, and then we kind of tell our story, well, well, it was the grace of God, and all the attention's on us. But in this moment, God says to Paul, no, 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 no. The attention's not going to be on you. It's going to be on me. And for the attention to be on me, I'm not going to work through your strength. I'm going to work through your weakness. God might leverage your success. He might leverage your success. But uh, this time, God didn't. And sometimes God doesn't. God says, this time I'm going to leverage your weakness. I'm going to get the glory from your life, but it's going to be through your weakness, not through your strength. And you know what? We don't get to choose sometimes which he uses. All of us have heard some amazing story. Somebody's been on the radio or on TV, and they tell about a tragedy, and their children were killed in an accident, and the house burned down, and they lost their finances and lost the job. And I mean, it's just one tragedy after the other. They tell their whole story, and you're listening to this going, how in the world did they get through this? You're trying to picture yourself, put yourself in their position. I don't know how they could do it. And at the end of the story, they say, you know what? I could only do this by the grace of God. See, they lived it. They experienced it. They could tell you firsthand what it means to have the grace of God. God has, God will. He'll leverage his strength, and he'll do it through our weaknesses. He'll do it through our weaknesses if we will accept his answer. When we beg God to answer this prayer, and God says, no. If we can accept that answer, we will experience his grace. Now, apparently Paul got to the place where he accepted the answer. Because he kind of reveals that in the rest of the verse. Look at the rest of verse number 9. So now, now that I've accepted this and come to terms with this and can accept that God's not going to answer this prayer, now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. No, I'm not really excited about this thorn on my side, but... If I can accept God's answer, all of a sudden, I have a whole different perspective of my life and who God is. In fact, he says in verse number 10, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the, the insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. And then this word for is in there. For simply means this. Look, I'm going to encapsulate, summarize everything for you in this one statement. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am 
strong. You hear people quote that all the time. What does that mean? It simply means this. When I don't have the ability, when God doesn't come through and answer my prayers, suddenly I'm forced to call upon God, lean on God for something I never did before, and I find a source of hope and help and strength that I would have never discovered if it hadn't been for this problem in my life. That's really what he's saying in that verse. That's when I'm weak, I'm strong. <laughs> well, when, when God says no, you, you, you've all prayed and you've asked God for something. When, when God says no, there's, there's, there's four things I want you to remember. Four things I want you to remember when God says no. Number one is this. Uh, we, we, we have the permission to ask God to remove our thorns. In fact, God invites us to ask him, oh God, would you please help me through this? Would you deal with this thorn, deal with the problem, deal with the the diagnosis, the dilemma, the divorce, whatever it is that's going on. Oh God, would you please answer my prayer? And God invites us, we're told over and over and over to pray because prayer is not trying to uh, leverage and manipulate an unwilling God to do something he doesn't want to do. Prayer simply is this, it develops our relationship with him. God has said no probably more than he said yes, but in the process of asking him, I get to know him better. So he invites us. He says, yes, you have permission to ask, which leads to number two. Uh, God has permission to say no. (laughs) Isn't that great? When we pray about stuff, God, you know how the the standard answers. He might say yes, he might say not now, or he might say no. I mean, you understand that principle, don't you? If you're a parent, you certainly do. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You've all been to the store, and whoever the store owners are, whoever developed this idea at the checkout, they put these flashing lights and just, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that are at eye level for kids that makes them go absolutely brain dead at the checkout. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. No, 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 no. And you have that fight and that battle with them there at the store. You know that whole kind of thing. And all that candy that's right there. It's kind of like the other night going around collecting all that candy. I saw kids come to my door that had pounds of candy. I'm thinking, what are they going to do with all that? If it was my kid and they got home and said, can I eat it? You know what I'm going to say? No, because I hate my kid. No, it's because I'm eating. No, I'm I'm just, (laughs) because I know it's not good for them. Sometimes God says no because he's got a whole different perspective of our circumstances than we do. The third thing is this, God might choose to show his power on the stage of your weakness. He might choose to show his power on the stage of your weakness, not on your strengths. And you know what? When you pray about stuff, can we just be real and honest here? Some things might never change. The healing may never come. The reconciliation may never come. The job you wanted might never come. The person you wanted to marry, you might never marry. Whatever it is you're begging God to bring into your life or get out of your life might never happen. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. The love of God does not change. Your circumstances don't determine God's level of love for you. He's not more in love for, for, for you one day than he is another day. He's not fickle. He's not moody like that. It just doesn't change. And then finally, number four, you can't experience God's grace if you fight his will. You can't experience his grace if you fight his will. Look, I've met people that tried to bargain with God for somebody's healing or for a job or for a spouse or whatever the case is, and they try to bargain with God, and if you, then I will, and I promise I'll never or I'll start or whatever the case might be, and they try to, and then God does not come through. He doesn't answer the prayer the way they thought he should answer the prayer, and then they're mad at him. And if you don't accept his answer, you don't have grace in your life. You've got a fight on your hands. And you're going to fight God at every level. You're going to be mad at God and angry with God because you bargained with God and you promised God. But understand this, God's in heaven and you're in Williston. Okay? That's just the reality of it. People get mad. They fight with God. They want to experience his grace. And as long as you refuse to take no for an answer, you're going to have a fight on your hands. In the verses that I read to you a moment ago, Paul eventually got to the place after praying three times and hearing no three times, said, all right, I guess this is the way it's going to be. And he just accepted God's answer. And when he accepted God's answer, he discovered God's grace. Just think about Jesus' own prayer. 
Jesus is in the garden one night. Jesus knew what crucifixion was. He was, he was, he was not uh, naive to crucifixion. He knew what crucifixion was. When he's in the garden praying to his father, he knew that his beard was going to be plucked out. He knew that he was going to be beaten. He knew that he was going to be whipped. He knew about the crown of thorns. He knew about the mocking. He knew about the eventual death on the cross. He knew all that. And he said, God, I don't want to do this. I mean, let's just be honest. I'd like you to remove this thorn from me. But it's not my will. It's your will. <laughs> if, uh, if this is what you've chosen for me, God, I guess I can handle it. After all, I don't really have a whole lot of options sometimes. There are some things that happen in our life. We have options. We've got choices. We've got some control over them. But there are other things over which we have no control, no options. That's when we get the grace of God. And you know how I know this? Because I've lived this. <laughs> if you've known your pastor for any length of time, I have an impediment. I know I'm strikingly handsome, but I have an eye problem. I'm glad you understand and recognize sarcasm. Your laughter is not very encouraging. That's telling me, it's like, Pastor, you're not as good looking as you think you are. I was born with a sight disability. In vitro, the optic nerves in my eyes never fully developed, so I was born with this, this sight problem. And do uh, you think that I've ever prayed that I could see as well as you? Once? Twice? Three times? <laughs> I've prayed way more than Paul. <laughs> and there really honestly, truly, came a time in that process of prayer when God, maybe not audibly said, but certainly gave me the impression and said, my grace is all you need. And he's helped me thus far do ministry. It's just amazing how the grace of God helps you. And I, I'm at the point now where I don't even know how I would live if I could ever see again. Robin does all the driving. Can you imagine the fight in the car if all of a sudden I started driving? <laughs> I'm in control now. <laughs> yeah, you know. Do I sometimes get sarcastic about it? Do I feel discouraged? You know. It still stings. Yeah, little kids, you know how kids are. Kids in school, they're, they, they tease and they can be kind of cruel. And There's times I'm looking at something and I'm reading maybe something up close and I want to be sarcastic because people will say, do you need glasses? And I want to slap my forehead and go, I never thought of that. <laughs> but my wife won't let me say that. So. <laughs> God bless our wives, amen? And sometimes, church, Sometimes our options are pretty limited because sometimes there are things that are out of our control and you can't change them. Only God can change them and when he doesn't change them, you've got two options. You can either accept his answer and experience his grace or you can fight with God and experience frustration. And today for a few minutes, I think we need to pray about some of that because I wonder if you're having those battles today. You've prayed a prayer, and you haven't prayed it once. You haven't prayed it three times. You've prayed it hundreds of times. Maybe you or somebody you know has become angry with God because God didn't come through. God didn't answer the prayer. God didn't fulfill. God didn't hold up his end of the bargain. He's God. And just because he didn't answer the prayer doesn't mean he doesn't love you. His love for you never changes. He's a good, good Father.